Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. Today we're talking about the first episode of Moon Knight with myself and Paul Hoppy, who are going into the show utterly blind, knowing nothing else about it, and with Will Freeland and Steve Storman, both from the Hype is My Superpower podcast, who have quite a bit more knowledge about this character from the comics. So we're going to have a great conversation back and forth. And I will also say for anybody who has not seen, who, know, who like Paul and I, knows nothing about this show going into it, we're going to have a non-spoiler section, which we're only going to discuss things from the first episode. And then we'll have a little section about, you know, some, some deeper stuff about the character after that. So even if you have only seen this one episode, you don't know anything else about the show, stick around for the first half. And then for everyone else, stick around for more. All that and more after a commercial break, we have no control over. Welcome back. This is Matthew, your host. Um, I am super hyped to have you two on to be discussing superpowers. Uh, Will, Steve, haven't had John for a little bit. How are you guys doing? Hyped to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's I, I really like guesting on pods, I think, because the onus of editing the pod afterward is not on us. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I, I that. feel. That's why I've maintained <laughs> years as a guest, not a co-host. permanent guest host, Paul Hoppy. Yeah, exactly. I know your I know your ruse. <laughs> I I definitely hear that. Uh, good friend of the pod and frequent co-host on the Star Wars Universe podcast, uh, Riki Hayashi, has volunteered very kindly to help me out with some of the editing. He wants to learn editing. He wants to be a part of the process. Um, I'm trying really hard not to do even more dumb things that have to be edited out knowing that he's going to do the editing of some podcasts, not this one, but some others. Um, but we're not perfect about that. So, it, Riki, it, sorry about that. You, we don't there, really need there to is try a, and do extra, you know, things to, to, to <laughs> yeah, cause trouble. We, like, we've learned that lesson good. the hard way because we, we hired our, our friend Nipuna uh, to edit our podcast recently. And uh, it, the monster has taken a life of his own. He started trolling us with uh, his edits, especially during the end credits. He'll just you know, repeat the most embarrassing thing that either of us has said for the entire <laughs> podcast. So if you want to tune into Hype is My Superpower, you will hear us get trolled relentlessly. I was going to say, the first, you had me in the first half. I was thinking, like, what can I hire this person to? But second, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll stay away. On that note, I do like to turn the shower water on first, bef- let it warm up before getting in. And then I will gradually crank it up even hotter as I'm in there. Yes. You yeah, know, I do think there's some ethics involved, like depending on how much hot water you have in your, you know, house and whether there's a drought, stuff like that. But in general, mm-hmm. you know, just because I know everybody was wondering. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I yeah. enjoyed that, that, <laughs> that uh, discussion in uh, your last episode. So moving right along. Um, <laughs> that's Paul Hoppy's voice for those who don't. We'll always have yet. to wonder about Matthew. Exactly. Um, Will and Steve, Will especially. Um like I said, I know nothing about the character going into this, and I want to kind of keep that uh, secrecy for the most part. Um, a- as Steve, you mentioned, there's a lot about the character that kind of mentioned in the marketing materials, none of which I've seen. Both Paul and I are very much on the no trailers, no spoilers, uh, hype bandwagon. But kind of so, so without getting into spoilers, though, Will, I know that you were super excited about this character. Um, yeah. I'm guessing because you're a big fan of him from the comic books. Talk, talk about... Um, uh, what? Why you're excited? Like, what is it you love about this character in the comic books, and how you sort of felt about this character coming to TV? Um, so Moon Knight is my third favorite superhero. Oh. Um, and he's so interesting to me for a handful of reasons. Uh, one, I guess we'll talk about later. But then, <laughs> um, <laughs> he was before we had a Marvel. Uh, uh, parody of Batman. He was the Marvel parody of Batman, of just like mm. normal guy gadgets, and uh, ends up also in the comics. He's a rich. He's a billionaire. Um, I don't know about billionaire. Maybe millionaire. But anyway, he has money. Uh, and he's got gadgets. He's got a plane. Uh, he has little like moon crescent moon shaped batarangs, like. He was just a lot of fun. I originally saw him in West Coast Avengers uh, way back in the day when I used to impulse buy comics at Walgreens. 
Um, <laughs> and he was the only one I didn't know at the time. Like there's Tigra and Hawkeye and uh, Dr. Pym. Uh, and there was this guy in all white with a cape and a hood and he was called Moon Knight and he only spoke every once in a while. And he was just this big mystery to me. Uh, and then he was in Marvel Ultimate Alliance and I got super stoked. And so he was my favorite character to play on that uh, way back in the day on uh, <clears throat> Xbox. Um, no, no. Uh, there are parts of his character that I really like in terms of um, understanding oneself and uh, coming to terms with your own inner demons versus um, your own rogues gallery, which he doesn't have a whole lot of. Um, but yeah, he's just been really interesting to me. And intimidation is a big thing. And for those who have seen The Batman, uh, there's a lot of intimidation tactics in that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a lot of that in... Moon Knight comics of the last like ten years. It's just he's a super fun read. Nice. Yeah, I I kind of I, I come at, at him from a little more shallow of a perspective because I haven't read a ton of Moon Knight myself. Uh, but I will say I was also very excited for this character to make his way to uh to screen, and uh for really two fairly superficial reasons. One. He has the coolest suit of any superhero, hands down. <laughs> Fight me. I don't care. Uh, the You've got, because in, in comics, right, you've got all of these characters who are dressed in very, like, loud, flamboyant colors. And it's just this, like, eyewash of just tons and tons and tons of color. It's just super saturated. Mm. It's very intense. It pops off the page. And then here's this guy who... When you've got a great colorist doing Moon Knight, and pretty much every colorist does this now, like, no color whatsoever. Like, just pure negative space on the page. He just, like, disappears. And he stands out so much more than all these brightly colored characters in the complete absence of color. Mm. It's really, really cool. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, and then um, a, a sort of spotlight panel for who who I consider Moon Knight to be and what I'm excited about for this is um, uh, there's a, a panel from um, a run a few years back by uh, Warren Ellis and Declan Shalvey. And they're asking, you know, why does this guy who operates at night and is night themed, why does he wear all white? <laughs> you know, like he, he, you know, you'd think you'd like visibility and he wouldn't want to be like, he's just a target out there. Why does he do this? And the other character responds, I won't swear on your podcast, but he's because he's effing crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's interesting because I hadn't even thought of it in these terms until Will said these exact words. But if you describe to me a character having an awesome costume, because they wear a white cape with a hood. <laughs> I'm going to have a very different connotation to that. Especially oh, having just seen Peacemaker. I didn't even think of that until you read contextual. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I. And, but for me, I went in. Literally, all I knew is that people were super excited about this character. I knew that issues of mental illness were going to be something that was going to be played up. And I knew that Egypt was going to be something that was featured. Um, that's literally all I knew. Uh, Paul, what about yourself? Had you picked up on anything or you like me pretty much in the dark? Um, no pun intended. Yeah, pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, I was interested in the series largely because I didn't know anything. Uh, I'd yeah. seen like one shot and looks cool, you know? Um, and I was like, oh, is that guy, that guy who played Apocalypse? Um, where you can't actually see his face either. But, yeah, let's forget uh, that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I like Oscar Isaac. Um, I, I knew that Ethan Hawke was in it. That was like basically the extent of what I knew. And that there were a lot of people who were really excited for it. And I was like, you know what? I'll just see it. Um, I knew kind of that the tone was going to be this kind of like mysterious sort of psychological thriller, kind of darker sort of whatever. And I'd I'd say that one of the things I enjoyed most about this first episode was that, like, I was finding out who the character was 
at the same time, the character was finding out who the character yeah. was, which felt yeah. like kind of a, a unique experience, except not unique, because it was a lot like The Born Identity, which was a lot like The Long Kissed Goodnight, two of which are my favorite movies. So, right. you know, I really like that sort of character not knowing exactly who they are, where they are, or like knowing aspects of themselves, but having other aspects of themselves they're unaware of, and kind of getting to like experience in that with them. Um, yeah. And I, I just really enjoyed that. So I'm looking forward to it. Especially, and I want to. Um, I'll say especially, and we're gonna step back in a minute and just kind of give overall thoughts. But I want to jump into this because to me it was so powerful. The way they did the fight scenes and the transitions into Moon Knight or Mark or whatever it is were so powerful. Mm. I mean, a because I just think fight scenes are kind of overdone, and so I think just the snap cut of what happens right before and then what happens after where, like you said, Paul, you're left to wonder, but you also therefore completely relate to what the character is going through. Right. Like, I feel like if I had seen the fight, it would be nowhere near as effective in terms of understanding just how confused he is. But then also having it be as the episode went on, you started getting a little bit more mm -hmm. in that um, Steven was now at least conscious of those kind of couple of seconds of the transition into the fight. Um, and then till the very end, at least where he actually gets to confront Moon Knight or Mark and, and willingly give up control. And thus we see a little bit, but even now still not seeing the fight. Right. Um, I thought it was utterly brilliant for the mystery. Of, I thought it was utterly brilliant for the effect of like, what is Steven thinking? But also to me, that makes Moon Knight seem much more intimidating and much more powerful than I think it would have been if we'd seen those fight scenes. Uh, I was having this conversation with friends over the weekend. A, a favorite topic of mine is how I think the first Alien movie is the scariest, in mm. part because they didn't have the budget to show the monster most of the time. And so they just show it in shadows and off screen. Mm -hmm. And thus your imagination has to fill in the gaps. Yes. And yeah, for me, having my imagination have to fill in oh my God, what happened? How did he, How are all these people dead now? It, it just made it, the character so much more intriguing. So if you permit me to absolutely nerd out for a second, uh, not, as a, not as a Marvel Comics nerd, but as a nerd of the comics form, um, this is one of the most, like, one of the most fascinating things for me that they, they brought in from the comics as a medium, not the comics as an established storyline or canon or whatever, is uh, the technique that uh, Scott McCloud and other comics theorists call it closure. So when you are reading comics, you don't really actually see anything happen, right? You see a series of static images, and it's up to your mind to connect them. It, it's all in the sort of like imagination space where the the actual action happens and you're just seeing this like series of flat images um and they call that that in between space the the closure which is the what's left for your mind to fill in mm -hmm. and they were able to import that technique or that um you know uh whatever you call it uh that terminology that that um that role of imagination from comics into the adaptation, uh, like you said, in a really elegant and uh, really well done way. I I also loved that. Uh, I love a good fight scene as much as anybody. When we were talking about when we had our show on Daredevil, remember I skipped just straight to all the good fight scenes and <laughs> yeah, didn't yeah. rewatch anything else. But um, I I think that yeah, being left to wonder, getting little hints, little. Uh, pieces was extremely compelling and a really cool storytelling decision. Mm -hmm. yeah, just on the dare, I want to let other people respond, but just on the daredevil thing, someone in the stranded Panda Facebook group commented, if you thought daredevil's one shot fight scene was great. Moon Knight gives you a zero shot fight. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, Brilliant. I, I will add on to that in terms of the specifically the, you know, episode two of season one, hallway fight scene it actually uses a lot of that sense as well where he goes into a room you hear oh, a yeah. struggle so someone true. goes flying out a microwave goes flying out right <laughs> 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 like <laughs> you know i mean we are left to like imagine a lot of what's going on in there 
um, as well as while we're enjoying like a, a no cut, you know, one shot um, right. fight scene. And then here I, having a zero uh, shot fight scene is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, it, I, I love the idea of like bringing that concept of comics into, um, into film, into live action. Um, and I think it, that was, it was very powerful for me. And just so I understand, so in the comics, there'd be moments where you have a scene with Steven and then the next panel is Steven after a time jump, just sort of seeing the results of what had happened. Like that kind of thing is happening in the comics. Everything I've read hasn't had that. Hasn't I can't this, think like, of a specific – I'm, I'm saying more just like the, the elemental mm, aspect okay. of comics going yeah. from panel to panel uses that constantly and it's cool to see – Oh, okay, now I get yeah, you. Yeah. Because it's a series of non-continuous still images. Like a movie is a series of still images, literally, right? But we are showing right. them so fast that we perceive motion. But comics, I, I actually, um, our friend Logan did this photographic novel where he was taking live action people and, you know, choreographing us and shooting a, a comic book. Um, and it was really cool. Um, I participated in it. I was doing Taekwondo a lot at the time and was in a bunch of fight scenes. And the, cool, you know, it, it, which was super fun, by the way, super yeah. fun, including one on like a train, uh, which was really cool. But, I'm going to have to read this. Yeah, I'll, I'll, awesome, try, and, awesome I'll try and get a book. copy for, for both of you. Um, but so it was like, I was realizing after it that it's so hard to show a fight scene in a series of still images, right? Because it's like so much of of fighting is the motion and so you can yeah. show like a hit landing but you don't know like how the leg was chambered or maybe you show it chambered and then you show someone on the ground or whatever and totally. and so i think that's that's what you're talking about steve right steven uh, steve sorry i'm confusing <laughs> steven uh with a v uh from, with you know where it's like that's that's just how the format is and and comics demand imagination in terms of interpreting the still images to like imagine what the motion actually is, right? Absolutely. Yep. So how did you two feel going into this? Like knowing that this comic that you had so much fondness for was going to be made into a TV show. Were you super excited? Were you a little bit nervous? Like, will they get it wrong? Uh, and especially as you started hearing more about like, the casting and stuff like that, how, how are you feeling about it? I, I was super excited just from a Moon Knight fanboy perspective. Um, and primarily for two reasons, one being the, having a character with like multiple personalities. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's too spoiler, but I mean, like we, we do see that we've got Steven Grant and we have Mark Spector. Um, yeah. and so, uh, the only other character that, that is part of their, um, established, like character is bruce banner and at least in the comics and that's definitely has not been a thing in mcu there are others um as far as mcu character or characters they could pull like legion and 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 um mm -hmm. a handful Aurora. of others however <laughs> for <laughs> like that have been on screen that have been announced um hulk was the first and they didn't do it and then so they've got moon knight and it's arguably more part of his identity for lack of a better phrase um and so i was excited to see how the mcu is going to incorporate that um yeah. and then also we've only seen norse gods and i'm always excited to see more pantheons brought into a universe um mm. and egyptian mythology is my second favorite mythology after norse i don't it might be because of Marvel, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but seeing the Ennead uh, talked about and represented and just Egyptian mythology in a world where we've already been bombarded with Norse imagery and mythology, I'm really mm -hmm. excited to see a world that knows there's more than one <laughs> kind of a thing. So I'm, I'm just, I'm excited for the future more than I am this first episode. <laughs> Yeah, right. for me, I mean, I I don't really, if it's bad, whatever, I'll watch it and I won't think about it again. If it's good, I get to enjoy something awesome. So, you know, it's pretty low stakes on my part. Um, and uh, 
I, I didn't really know what to expect going in. Um, Oscar Isaac, obviously, it can be fantastic. He was also uh, utterly forgettable in X Men Apocalypse, um, and uh, I was gushing about the suit before what I saw in the marketing materials of the suit. It's like gray and it doesn't jump off the screen at all in the same kind of way. I'm like, all right, whatever. But um, that was just going into it again. That Marvel, you know, the Marvel shows on Disney plus have been a mixed positive for me. The highs have been high. The lows have been low, but overall, you know, pretty good. So uh, yeah, I, I had high hopes. Nice. I, I yeah. would suggest like watching the first five episodes and then writing the story in your mind for what the last episode is and then maybe mm. watching it or not just <laughs> from the track record of the, the Disney Park. I, I would, yeah, I think from the track record, I would write the last episode just always being blue lasers versus red lasers. Yeah, pretty but... much. Yeah. <laughs> and a yeah. horde of nameless creatures. Yeah, I I definitely think Disney has had a number of shows that or the Disney MCU has had a number of shows that were very good, did not stick the landing very well. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know that's something we'll get into as the as the show goes on. Uh, so what did everyone think of episode one? We can now kind of dive into the episode itself. I thought it was fantastic. It definitely yeah. exceeded my expectations. It was a lot of fun. Oscar Isaac chewed every available piece of scenery, just <laughs> made an absolute meal out of it. And it was so wacky and so much fun. And I just, I really, I really had a good time with it. One thing I really loved, and I'm not saying that everything should be this way, but a lot of times in Marvel stuff, you have numerous scenes where you, the audience, now know more than any particular one character. Because... You're in a room watching these characters do this thing, but then you're in this other room watching these other characters do this thing. And I love that literally every second we saw on screen was only what – I think this is true – was only what Steven yeah. was perceiving. That's you know? a really good point, yeah. Uh, not only just the different parts of Moon Knight, but like you know the, the weird village that they go to um, with, with the kind of Egyptian ritual thing happening, all the stuff about like – you know, we never – I think it would be very easy to show the woman he asks out on a date at the restaurant waiting for him. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of things like that. The fact that we never get any of that, we only get what he's experiencing. I, I just, I think it's in part why I'm all of a sudden much more cautious about spoilers than I even thought I would. Because I just love that I'm right inside his head. And like you said, Paul, I only know what he does right now. It's a really great point, yeah. Yeah, it, it reminds me of like a detective story, you know, or like it's got this sort of noir vibe of there's a lot of, you know, movies, I think, in the noir genre where you have the whole time you're just with the detective, you're with the main character, you know, it right. just follows the one character and basically their viewpoint the whole time. And the whole story is us learning what they learn as they learn it and kind of it feels first person, you know, a lot of those stories will have some sort of internal narration and here we didn't have that, but we had sort of almost effective in, it was like external narration where, you know, where like somehow I yeah. felt like I knew what he was thinking by who he was talking to, but it didn't feel like a bunch of like ridiculous expository dialogue. Um, yeah. And, and they, he talks to the statue. He talks to right. other people. Although that was a dude, right? I, I think, think that, that was, was a person. Yeah. I thought, it, I thought it was a statue at first, but I think it's one of those people like in the park, who paints themselves. Oh, okay. And that, yeah. Got it. Got oh. it. I didn't realize that part. Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> you thought, yeah, yeah. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, Lee got it. And then she's like, that's one of those guys. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's definitely that's one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that feeling of like the way that they use pacing and, um, you know, color and light, but also the sound, you know, it, it's just, it, it feels like being right there with the character and, um, you know, I found Steven very relatable in a lot of ways. And part of that's just the way it's, it's shown, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I'm really looking forward to sort of enjoying that journey. And right after watching the show, or maybe, maybe like 80% of the way through, I was like, how am I going to podcast on this with people <laughs> who know all this stuff about what might or may <laughs> not happen? I was like, it feels like this whole journey is this like journey of discovery, you know, and um, I don't know. Sometimes when I see certain things, I like 
like I envy someone being able to not know something going in, you know, and that sort of experience. And I'm like, I want that experience this time. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I definitely found I was relating very much to the character as well, in particular in regard to mental illness. And I want to be very clear, to my knowledge at this point, I feel like I don't yet know, does this character have, like, disassociative identity disorder, what we used to call multiple personality disorder? Is it something that manifests in a similar way, but it's due to these outside, more like spiritual influences? Um, and, and it's funny we bring that up because literally just a couple of days ago, Paul and I record. Literally yesterday, Paul and I recorded on Spider-Man: Far From Home. I'm sorry, sorry, Spider-Man: No Way Home, where I think they do something interesting with Green Goblin slash Osborn. Uh, you know, Norman Osborn, where it's like not quite clear: is the Green Goblin some like thing chemically induced, chemically induced, or does he have? DID because of the trauma, whatever. And I don't want to get into the answer to that because I want to let the show answer that. And I'm sure people who have seen the marketing are like, Matthew, you're an idiot. You should know this. I don't. I'm happy not knowing. But either way, the experience of other people getting mad at you because they expect you to know things that you don't or that they are – they think your excuses for why you didn't do a thing that you committed to do – are nonsense or like and i don't blame any of the other people who did that like i think yeah if you get stood up for a date i think it's completely legitimate to think this guy's a jerk but i had so much empathy for him in those moments like particularly those two phone calls one with the woman he'd asked out and then second with this person um kate was it kayla or layla. lana or something layla, layla thank you who was calling him and and like I just had so much sympathy for him in terms of like, I don't know what your mental deal is, but I 100% had these situations and I really get it. And I thought they, they made it both funny, but also very sad in this way where it felt like they were letting you laugh at the, at the ridiculousness of it without letting you laugh at him totally. uh, and still honoring his pain in the situation, which I was just so that, that level of subtlety was so impressive to me. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, Paul, for you, what do you think is going on? <laughs> like, what's your <laughs> what, what's your guess at this point? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think you know, he's someone who has at least two personalities. I don't know whether mm -hmm. it's you know DID or whether it's um, something more sort of magic-y or whatever. Right. Um, and I'm not sure how much that matters in terms of actual... I mean, it matters in terms of, like, representation and, and stuff like that. And right. obviously, you want to try and be accurate about certain things. Um, but it, it's, you know, obviously, he's someone who, from what we've seen, we've seen him be Steven. And then there's also Mark, right? And... Mark seems like a pretty hardcore badass um, yep. and Steven, not so much. Um, and in terms of what's going on, like in the plot, like uh, they, they mentioned avatars, right? And he made a joke about avatar and then avatar, the last airbender. And I, I enjoyed and appreciated all of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but having had to clarify that more than once in my lifetime, but you know, <laughs> I, I think like maybe he's an avatar for one of the, um, you know, one of the Egyptian gods. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And the, uh, the Ethan Hawke character um, is, clearly doing something that he thinks is good uh you know involves killing people but like mm -hmm. uh gave some I, I actually really liked kind of the the <laughs> shout outs if you want to call them but like you know they mentioned hitler but like also mentioned the armenian genocide and pol pot and you know I, I, one other that i i forgot what it was but like that you know don't get mentioned as much right in terms of atrocities mm -hmm. of humanity that perhaps could have been prevented um you know, so I kind of thought, like one of the ethical questions that like came up was like, I don't know, killing baby Hitler. Yes. No. You know, um, maybe just get <laughs> yeah. him into art school instead. I don't know. Um, but but like, you know, and the idea of like uh, preventative justice, essentially. Um, but yeah, I, I, just, I liked their interactions um, 
but yeah, I, I still don't have that much of an idea what's going on. Maybe that's pretty much what's going on is this one dude is related to one God and this other dude's related to another God and they're like going to battle. I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Can co- neither confirm nor deny. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Until yeah, after I, I you leave. I refuse to confirm or deny. <laughs> <laughs> you can, but you won't. And it's appreciated. Um, yeah, no, I think I, I, I'm very much in similar places. Like, I'm, I'm trying not to sort of let my brain run with too many theories because I'm just so darn curious about it all. Um, but I think that, like you, Will, I really love the idea of bringing the Egyptian god stories into this a little bit more. I'll admit, I have a deep love of Egyptian mythology but my knowledge of it comes from two very um, places that you take with a big grain of salt. One of which is the Vampire the Masquerade and other <laughs> White Wolf role-playing games, which has a lot of like vampiric lore. Like the, the Egyptian god Set is a vampire, and so it tells the story of Set and Osiris and and all of that kind of thing. But again, in their own particular way, so I'm not sure how accurate that is. Uh, the other is the Cain Chronicles, which are the books uh, – for those of you who know the Percy Jackson books, the author Rick, Re- Rick Reardon – I think I'm pronouncing that right – has also now done a series of books that are very similar to that but with a couple of other pantheons. And the mm. Cain Chronicles are about the Egyptian gods, uh, and he's now doing another set about the Norse gods, which, by the way, have a trans character as the main character, which was one of the main characters, which I absolutely love. And in those books, I think he's trying to be fairly accurate to – Egyptian mythology, but also doing a lot of like, what would Egyptian gods be like in this in this world? Um, so so yeah, so I'm both really curious, but also going in with a like, I, my own not like when I watched Thor and stuff like that, I'd spent a lot of time with people who were you know very dedicated to Norse gods and things like that, so I really knew that background. Here I don't. I know it from these two pop culture sources that may or may not have any accuracy whatsoever. So. <laughs> Uh, not, not that I think this is going to be like 100% the most accurate thing in the world, but it's going to be fun to see how it plays out. I My, think you're uh, going to mention Carter and Shaira Hall, but anyway. <laughs> Who is that? What? Oh, Hawk Girl and Hawk. Hawkman? Hawk, Hawk Girl? Hawk, no? Hawk okay. Hawk oh, yeah, right. okay. Never mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on a very different uh, path for Egyptian mythology in comics, I highly recommend... Uh, a book called Pantheon, the true story of the Egyptian deities by Hamish Steele. It's published by No Brow uh, Comics. And it Mm -hmm. is, um, it kind of takes the approach that um, a lot of mythological, like myth, mythological stories were um, essentially uh, lowbrow humor, Uh, you know, that they were folk tales and they were just like something entertaining to pass the time and the the entertaining stories stuck around and so there's just a bunch of like you know um very silly stories about the gods and a lot of um body jokes uh b-a-w-d-y and you know a lot of just like really out there wild stuff um and and you know and uh i guess that's slightly backed up i took a class in in college about you know the mythic underpinnings of society and religion and it had some extremely graphic stories about the sun god ross you know and mm-hmm. uh spreading his seed upon the world etc um so it yeah really fascinating like different type of mythology like in tone in uh, practice than the your sort of standard idea of these are the gods and this is their pantheon and this is the structure and blah 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 blah. No, it's it's it it's deeply foreign and weird in a way that uh, I I really hope to see represented. Mm-hmm. So, what else did you like about this episode, or not like? What are the things worth commenting on? Um, I really liked so knowing that. Um, there's going to be a personality thing going on. I really liked how many reflections they had uh, mm. throughout the episode. Mm. Uh, and like, as the episode went on and you start to get the like man in the mirror being a different image kind of a thing. Um, there started to be more and more reflections <laughs> as he, as Steven was getting more and more confused, but more and more involved in 
what Mark was doing, there happened there just there was more and more reflections just like in a display case or mirror or like in the elevator or just like windows. It was a lot of fun to watch. Oh, sorry. Um <laughs> go off. At the end of the episode, um I really really liked that there wasn't wanton destruction of hmm. the Egyptian oh, uh, yeah. exhibit. Yeah. Both, both the monster and Steven went out of their way to not knock anything over. Like, even when the that monster cool. was jumping from column to column and wall to wall, it still avoided all of the exhibit pieces. Mm-hmm. And, like, that just has this, like, underpinning of reverence to these um artifacts that are from could be from the same place and time that this monster is from and so like there is this like respect to the display it's not just here's a set let's destroy it in a chase scene um Mm -hmm. right and then like uh steven didn't actually knock anything over until he got to the back room and he specifically chose like of the three shelving units to knock over it was one with like cleaning supplies in it (laughs) and it wasn't any like actual like stock i thought that was really yeah yeah i i'm so curious with what they're gonna do with the museum side of things especially because in like the movie black panther specifically called it out there's a lot of people who are unhappy that all these artifacts from all over the world are in the British Museum. Totally. Um, and I, I, the whole thing about like, where did you get the scarab? Give me back the scarab. Clearly, there's an element of like, we want this for our ritual stuff. But I, I, I'm wondering if there's also a sense of like, you slash the British Museum shouldn't have these things. You know, these things shouldn't be here, a thousand miles away from where they're from. Um, and like, like I said, in Black Panther, they did a great job calling that out. I know that um, I, this was true some time ago. I'm sure it's still – I think it's still true. Right now, the entity that has the most cases against it at the uh, International Court of Justice is the British Museum. Wow. There's something like 100 different countries suing them <laughs> to get their stuff back. Incredible. Um, so I, I really like the idea of him working there but also in this like pretty low – you know, pretty low down – uh, you know, just selling candy place and him loving the stuff, but not actually being part of the exhibits. I'm really curious seeing how that's how that's all going to play out. Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see how Moon Knight at the museum plays out. In the rest of the series. <laughs> well played, wow. well played. <laughs> <laughs> I, I applaud that you probably wrote that a while ago, and we're just searching for the moment. I, I was just <laughs> waiting. I was just waiting for the spot. I was waiting for it. <laughs> so, one concern I want to bring up, and and Will and Steve, this might be hard for you because you probably both know the answer to this, but I just needed to, to say it. And Paul, you can get into it as well. I am going to be a little sad if we learn that Mark slash Stephen is themselves Egyptian or like of Egyptian descent mm-hmm. because I love Oscar Isaac and I love the idea. I don't know if his character originally is white or was always meant to be brown skin or what. And especially if they're white or even if they're, you know, if it's kind of not important, I love the idea of casting a Latino actor for that role. If the role is supposed to be Egyptian or Arab or anything like that, I think it would be a little bit bummed that Oscar Isaac get cast for it just because you want, like, I want Oscar Isaac and more Latino actors have more roles. I don't want it to be a sort of thing of like, you know, brown people can play brown people of what whatever kind. Um so, yeah, I was curious, Paul, was that something you kind of were, were thinking about at all during this? Yeah, I mean, going in, I did know that there was some sort of Egyptian connection, um, but I but didn't know and still don't know exactly how that works. Um, mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I think Oscar Isaac is uh, Guatemalan-American, right? And, yeah, that's right. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, I like seeing more Latino actors in more roles and having – um him as a you know the main character and like speaking like british english too i think is is like cool also you know Mm -hmm. um but yeah if it's like if the character is like supposed to be primarily of egyptian descent directly like then it is a little like uh okay i don't know like i I guess you didn't want to get rami malik or i I don't know you know but like yeah 
I will say there has been a conversation on the internet around the release of this series about the identity of uh of the the main character here. Mm -hmm. Uh it may not be the one that you're expecting. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I I would look forward to it. I mean it's certainly if this is meant to be a character descendant from ancient Egypt, sure. like the possibility of that that you know, bloodline winding up in Guatemala or Latin America a thousand years ago. Like, I, th there's all sorts of ways you could make it make sense. I just hope that it's a little bit acknowledged in some way or that I'm completely wrong about this. Or, or that it's, like, not a thing at all, right? Like, we just don't right. get any real clarity in terms of, you know. Mm. Yeah, because certainly it doesn't – they make a reference to Mark being very interested in Egyptian sort of stuff. So he doesn't have to be descended from that by any means. But right, right. we'll see. In the comics – He's Jewish American. Uh, he's from like Chicago, I think. Uh, his dad's a rabbi. Oh, interesting. Really? Okay. It, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to the best of my knowledge, he has in the comics he has zero Egyptian descendancy. Uh, okay. Outside of this uh, otherworldly influence. Interesting. Okay. Cool. What? Well, I'll be very curious to see how that plays out. I mean, certainly after Wanda and other things like that, I hope this isn't – I would be amazed if they if they erase that part of it, especially if his dad's a rabbi. That seems like it's a very important part of a character. Um, so I'd be surprised if that gets totally erased the way Wanda's Jewishness does. But it, yeah, like you said, it's that very different. That, right? that, <laughs> like, that, was well, the that was the conversation I was alluding to. They, yeah. yeah. They are, as far as I'm aware, they're not making him Jewish in, in the show. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't. And, I don't know if one this of the, falls under one of the, the creators like, you want to know or you don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. Uh, Paul, speaking of representation, I think <laughs> was there another issue that you might want to bring up here? Yeah. Like it's really cool to see like a vegan main character. We don't get very many. Like we don't get very many <laughs> vegan characters at all. Oh um, yeah. Almost every single time, like it's a joke, you know, and like so like. The thing about, like, okay, he's got another personality who's not a vegan, fine. And that personality set up a date and wanted to go to a steakhouse. Okay. Um, you know, you probably need to figure out your things and figure something out. But, like, then him going there and then, like, sitting there and ordering a steak, I'm like, w like, like, you were so close. And then so far, and it's like, it's that, I think, you know, there's like, when it comes to representation, there's like no representation, like invisibility, then there's like bad representation, and then there's like neutral representation, like just existing, but not being important. And then there's like good representation. And like, this feels somewhere between bad and neutral. And it's like, that's just, it's like Phoebe on Friends. Oh, there's a vegetarian character. Oh, she's like who she is you know and like <laughs> right. and it's just the fact that we are where we are now where obviously there is so much you know oppression and persecution and just bigotry in so many ways but like you're kind of not allowed to do a lot of that in mainstream media anymore like in mm. certain right like there's been a huge effort to try and do less anyway and like yeah. i feel like we haven't gotten that far in terms of like vegetarianism or like vegans. Like they're like, yeah, there's some characters now, you know, but it's like overall, it's just so often a joke or like something negative in some way um, that it's, it's like, it was like interesting and then disappointing. And it's like, I've gotten used to disappointment. You know, it's maybe it's not as bad as Danny Rand in, in Iron the Iron Fist series being like, oh, yeah, we used to eat donkey, you know, even though we're vegetarians, you know, because the monks want us to be. And like that was like, hmm. but, you know, like <laughs> I just don't know if anything's me... as bad as Danny Rand in the Iron Fist <laughs> Netflix that's, show. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's fair. Um, <laughs> yeah. I still like this character. You know, I yeah. still have hopes. But uh, but that was that was really the only real negative in this episode for me. I was just like, All right, there it is. Okay. You know, yeah. and I mean, I know people have had to live with that for whatever, you know, identity vectors or whatever for decades. And like, you know, it's just like, it would be nice to be, you know, just like, yeah, let's have a few vegetarians or vegans who just happen to be. And it's like, it's not that big a deal. 
Like, we just don't mm-hmm. make a joke right. out of it, you know? Like, just occasionally. It would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a vegetarian, I'm... Well, I'm not. I, I'm not right there with you if you're vegan, but you know, halfway. Close enough. Close. I mean, you, you, yeah. you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> like, you, you see it. Yeah, and I really appreciate that perspective because I had a very different read on that scene, and which I, I'm not trying to say that I think mine is right by any means sure. compared to yours, because like I said, I'm not vegan, so I don't see it in that light. To me, what that was about was like I have definitely had moments when my mental illness was really at its worst. Where I found myself doing things that made no sense to my values and mm-hmm. no sense to the things like – but – and sometimes it was a sort of like, well, I, I've been trying to like live my life by these ideas, but it's not working and it, nothing makes sense to me. So what the hell? Why don't I just do this thing that I always said I would never do, mm. you know? And then later being like, oh, well, actually that was kind of dumb. And the, I think the fact that we don't see him eat the steak mm-hmm. – like I – my read on that is that there's a good chance that he orders the steak, get in part because he's just so uncomfortable and right. nothing makes sense to him. Yeah. And and he's just like, I yeah, very good, whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. And yeah. and then oh, he gets well the steak done. and then is like, Why would I do this? No, right. no, and like catches himself yeah. in some yeah. way. I think that's the light in which I saw it. But given that, I think it would have been nice if they had had a different mo- like either if they show him very clearly not eating the steak yeah. or have some yeah, like other more positive moment. Yeah, show some other moment in a more positive way of him being a vegan that makes more sense. Yeah, that, well, that... I mean, I think his his veganness is being used in in this way to. Uh, this is maybe the, the more the part of the representation that I take issue with is that it's it's being used to show him as um, less, uh, you know. Uh, to as a counterpoint to who we assume Mark is, right? Even though we mm-hmm. haven't seen Mark yet, uh, to to underscore Stephen being meek or you know so uh, or passive. Um, that's very fair. And so yeah, that that's kind of annoying. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I think the flip side, the sort of charitable interpretation, might be that like, you know, he's got this one personality who likes to go around and kill people. And eats meat, and then he's got this other personality that doesn't like to go around and kill people, and doesn't, and like that maybe, you know. But that is this like very meek, put upon, you know, right. character. If if the character weren't so otherwise like very nuanced feeling and mm-hmm. like real feeling and genuine, and like this, you know, this sweet guy who's in this situation that's obviously very difficult, I think I would have like had a much stronger reaction whereas here it felt it was a little bit more like an eye roll reaction as opposed to like mm-hmm. you know like there were other ways that if the character was just this like very stereotypical unnuanced portrayal um i think it would have bothered me a lot more that's very fair i don't have this anything times new where... to add to this okay. i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those times where i was trying not to jump in because i've been jumping in all the time but then you know <laughs> silence um yeah, it'll be interesting, and I mean, this is a very off-topic thing, but it, it kind of makes me think I would love to see a character who is maybe a just very blood-soaked hero, maybe an anti-hero, or a straight-up villain, but someone who is like, well, yeah, humans are terrible. I'm going to kill humans. That's fine. But, like, <laughs> animals never hurt me. Why would I hurt an animal? I'm going to eat plants. Like, I, I mean, think that would be speaking super- of I could see, fist. I could see, like, Doctor Doom going for that. Right, Just right. being like, this is the logical thing to do. There is no point in me spilling this senseless blood. But obviously I'm above I deserve to rule humanity. Yeah, yeah. So by whatever means necessary. But like, have you seen the carbon footprint of of the, <laughs> the beef industry? That would be like, I want I want to rule of a vibrant and healthy world by my iron fist. <laughs> I love that. Number one. Number yeah. two. Speaking of, uh, and I I want to see like a Doom series at some point. Oh, um, yes. Number two. Speaking yeah. of Iron Fist, uh, Davos is like the principal antagonist in season two and is at some point he's like i'm vegetarian as he's like killing a bunch of people yeah and like i actually kind of liked that yeah Uh, that's kind of awesome um and then there's a third thing but i forgot what it was so oh my super villain plan maybe i'll save that for later okay (laughs) i do have a soup i I have like a vegan super villain plan 
cool. Oh, well, yes. we'll invite the FBI to stop listening as well at the spoiler break, <laughs> so we can uh, get into that. Um, For how Paul so becomes the vegan six. super hit villain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think all of this is connected to ethics because clearly this character is going to be one that is, there's a lot of ethics around. And I, I will say, now that you say that, I remember – I remember that I had heard that he's the son of a rabbi and being very interested in that, especially because of uh, – like I love Daredevil so much in part because of the way he, Catholicism is a part of his character and a part of the way he shapes it. And so I was very curious to see kind of the ethical decision-making of a character who's coming from a Jewish perspective. And, and you know, I, again, I don't know and please don't tell me. It might be these complete – you know, he's very much the kind of like rabbi's kid, preacher's kid who's like the hell with that. I want nothing to do with that or it still influences him. I don't know, but I think it'd be fascinating. But, but let's kind of dive into what has been raised. I think is one of the main. Oh, go I, ahead. I I just wanted to put one more point in there on, um, on uh, Moon Knight being Jewish. It's it it seems to be one of the thing those things in the comics that comes up sometimes and doesn't come up other times. If I were to rank preeminent Jewish characters in Marvel, I don't know if he would be in the top five. You know, mm-hmm. he's behind. Okay. He's behind, uh, you know, The Thing and Magneto and Kitty Pride, and so on. So and Wanda and others. Yeah, okay. and w- well, yeah, well, yeah, Wanda. Sure. They they've made such Sometimes. a mess of of her right. origin <laughs> in the comics that who knows what right. y- she right. and Pietro are. But yeah, <laughs> and I will also just say, if anyone's wondering why I'm not, then wondering about like why is Oscar Isaac playing a Jewish person. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's very important to kind of note, like, the idea that all Jews are white is very, very much not true. Totally. And, um, you know, so just just to kind of bear that in mind. Uh, but, okay, so to me, I think kind of the most interesting ethical question, like, all this is kind of ethically connected, but the most interesting ethical question that's raised is this idea of if you know with absolute certainty that a person is going to do something terrible, how do we feel about punishing them beforehand? I mean, A, the death penalty, not great. I think we all kind of agree on. But just like th- this idea of the goddess being like, I'm so sick of waiting for people to do harm. If it's my job to punish those who do harm, I'm just going to do it before the harm actually happens. Yeah, well, I think I'm supposed the to just reject usually that. usually came after the crime. Oh, wait. No. What? That's yeah. Winter Soldier. <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's also mirrored in an interesting way by Stephen's rituals, right? He go, he locks himself up uh, with a combination lock that presumably only he would remember uh, the, the the combination to. He puts mm-hmm. the tape on the door. He puts the sand around the bed, right? Like he has at least some inclination that whatever happens when he misses time involves somebody doing bad things otherwise he wouldn't be so desperate to stay in control and mm-hmm. so this is kind of a, a a mirror image of like he's trying to um to to stop some sort of terrible thing from happening you could say by you know uh punishing himself or some other aspect of what happens when he misses time um in you know mm-hmm. chaining himself to a bed Yeah, I can so, yeah. I, I loved think prevention that, um, is better than punishment of something mm-hmm. that you know. So like, mm-hmm. I I'm not I'm not a fan of these trials of Amit. Uh, judging your past and your future, like that just. What is that old woman gonna do? <laughs> right, that That's was so was heinous. Like, what's she yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it depends on what you think. Is I have to, yeah, just also just judging from Marvel's track record on here in the way that they villain code characters by making them do, you know, either ma- be massive hypocrites or, you know, claim to have high minded ideals, but then um, do um, very unforgivable things in order to unambiguously code them at villains. Uh, I'm, that didn't really come up to me the the idea of preemptive judgment or preemptive uh punishment because i i find it from their own track record very hard to convince to believe that everything is on the level in terms of like this person is actually you know legitimately judged to be fated to do terrible things and isn't just being killed in for some other uh Mm -hmm. nefarious reason Mm -hmm. 
So you're just kind of not buying it. On, on I'm just not buying yeah. it at all. Yeah, yeah. I'm fair. sorry to, to just yeah. not participate with your very yeah. fair and high-minded question. It just, I don't think that, that Marvel has, uh, that Marvel, uh, you know, studios, that the MCU has earned the benefit of the doubt for me. Yeah. In, yeah. In well, it gets brought up in the comics of way more often than it has in the oh, MCU. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think it's a very good point, and I will say for me, at first, one of the things that made it sort of like, okay, this is a little bit valid, is the fact that people were consenting to be judged. You know, that the mm, people, mm, I, my sense right. at least was that they were all there, and they were all volunteering for it. When he then tries to judge Stephen, who has no idea what's going on, um, that that crosses a line for me, to be sure. And mm. I was having trouble seeing it, I think, because... Um, Am I right that the scales kind of danced around and didn't really quite – the scales didn't yes. clearly say Stephen is good. They just were like, uh, you know, the, answer not yeah. found, 404. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. <laughs> Ask again later in your Magic 8 ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean – I was going to say, which I really like because – Paul and I talked about have talked about this a lot in terms of time travel stuff. I generally really don't like the idea that your that, that what you are going to do in the future is already written, you know, because right. to me that like where is agency if everything is already written or everything's already known? There's all sorts of questions there. But the but if the idea is that for most people it is known or maybe sort of known as you're saying Steve, but that for Moon Knight it's not, that I think adds a really interesting twist to his character. Mm. Yeah, he said there's chaos in you. Right, mm -hmm. which maybe mm -hmm. could be like it didn't judge it. Maybe there's chaos, like chaos magic, and maybe that's like where the whole thing comes from. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Some of us maybe know already. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting point about the people's agency and choosing to be judged or not. I think mm -hmm. if that's this very kind of cultish situation, though, I think they don't have zero agency, but their agency might be compromised in some way. Um, also true. You yeah. know, through also social true. pressure and, and whatever. Um, so I, I'm not a fan of it either way, but I'm even less of a fan of it, you know, the, um, the non-consensual way. I totally agree with Will. Like, yeah, if you know that someone's supposed to do some bad thing or whatever, then don't you know when it is? And can't you just then like stop it? <laughs> like, can we just stop it instead? You know, like yeah. maybe we don't have to kill baby Hitler. Maybe we can do something else. I mean, you know butterflies right. flapping and like what what's what's the what's going to happen if you do one thing and then you know i mean i don't know um the idea of these types of like omniscience in terms of you know what's actually going to happen and then i mean whose decision of like what's good and evil and whatever it's mm -hmm. it's it's very uh yeah i'm, I'm against it that's I'll, I'll just summarize there For yeah sure. i think I think that's very fair, especially uh, because uh, to me, the, the problem with like, even the baby Hitler kind of thing, uh, Becky Allen came on the Star Wars podcast a while ago to talk about this, the idea of the, the great man of history kind of theories. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem isn't does baby Hitler go to art school or not? The problem is the crushing economic situation that right. Germany is faced with combined with all the conspiracy theories and lies about how World War One had actually not really been lost, something we have no experience of today. Uh, combined with the massive anti-Semitism in the cultural right. right, like totally. If it's not Hitler, someone else comes along. Right, you know? right, yeah. Um, and I think that's always the, the 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 issue here. So, not to discount the possibility, you know, the the role in individual people to, you know, uh, to act upon history in terrible or potentially good ways. But yeah, there's a much much larger mass of people who are willing to go along with whatever terrible things the the you know uh right the tyrant said than yeah. just the tyrant yeah things right. would be different but they wouldn't be completely different like mm -hmm. right you still have a lot of the same problems exactly exactly all right well we're already about an hour and audience i have to confess to you i'd said that we're gonna kind of kick paul off um and then keep talking with will and steve and a slightly more spoilery version but a i think will and steve you both said that kind of it, in a lot of ways, this episode is not very similar to the comics, and so there's not too much more for you to go into about that. Uh, or that, Will, I think you said that uh, um, uh, holding in the reins to sort of spoil a little bit but not too much would be <laughs> perhaps a lot to ask. And, Paul, you've just convinced <laughs> me, like, yeah, I'm having so much fun not knowing. So I think we're just going to hold off there. 
uh, and not get in any of that. But I will say, I mean, you should always be checking out Hype is My Superpower because it's a great podcast. But I know Will and Steve are going to talk about this a little bit more on that podcast. Will apparently has an idea for a very different first episode that he thinks would have been just a little bit better than this one. So <laughs> check that out on an upcoming episode. <laughs> and probably it, probably once the whole show is wrapped up, myself or Paul or both of us will get on their podcast with them. And there we can talk a lot more about sort of what this was like for you as people who had read the comics and stuff like that. So, all right. So, so based on that, I think we're not going to get into a spoiler section. So is there any other kind of last comment about the show uh, that we watched that you all want to bring up? I know I have one last thing, but anybody else? Uh, the fish, the fish was great. It was, yeah. that was a, that was a fantastic little device. That's mm-hmm. all. I yeah, love, I'm, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, I love that Steven clearly really cares about the fish um and unfortunately mark probably killed the fish or something (laughs) yeah well that's the thing what i love is that i have no idea if mark has some kind of fin healing powers or if mark accidentally killed the fish and then just tried to replace the fish for steven you know like there's so many things that could have happened there that i have no idea what's going on well the clerk at the pet store said uh you said the same thing yesterday yeah yeah yeah. You're looking so for clearly... one finned fish. We don't have those. Yeah. Call a vet. <laughs> yeah, we lost right. yeah. the fish. Yeah, that was fun. Um Okay. Interesting. I I liked this episode. I have so many questions. Um I my initial reaction to the Moon Knight suit is is not as excited as I think I want it to be. Um, mm-hmm. but I want to see, I want to see what episode two brings mm-hmm. before I really have a judgment on it. Yeah. I, the one last thing I wanted to mention is it opens with a song called every grain of sand, which is by Bob Dylan that I only know about it is, is one of his more obscure songs in part because it's written when he was in his born again, Christian phase. Um, mm-hmm. I only know about it in part because it was written when he was in his born again Christian phase. And so I heard it in church and I think it's an absolutely gorgeous song and, and the allusions to it are, are pretty clear, but at least they're a little bit, um, you know, metaphorical and the like, but they're direct quotes often from either Psalms or other parts of the old Testament. And so I just love hearing that song and hearing all the discussion that we're hearing. Cause there's some discussion about like, is that song part of his being a born again Christian Bob Dylan also had a lot of time kind of trying to reconnect with uh, his Judaism because Robert Zimmerman, he was born Jewish. Um, I mean, Dylan's religion is could have a whole podcast on that. It's hit pretty much every major religion in the world at some point in time. (laughs) Um, But it's such a gorgeous song and I loved having it included. And I, I think it's so interesting to have included because one of the ideas of it is that, you know, God is in control of every, every single thing you see around you, every blade of grass, every grain of sand, God controls. Uh, and God is, is a sign of the, the, the beauty of God's creation. And so, A, given the sand reference makes total sense, but also just this idea of how much are the gods in control, how much is your fate written or not. It, it's such an obscure song, and the fact that they found it and used it for this, <laughs> I just loved so much. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Cool. It also... Uh... Has the theme of oh, never mind. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we could also talk about "Wake Me Up Before You Go Go," but that doesn't have nearly the textual significance. <laughs> uh, George Michael has definitely led a couple of different lives over the course of his career in terms of how comfortable he is with identity. Uh, I'm getting into some very different places there. Um, all right, so thank you all so much for people who want to check out more of your stuff. Um, for Steve and Will, where can they find you, and what what will they find? Yeah, uh, well, you can find us on our podcast, Hype is My Superpower. Just minutes before uh, we started recording this, I uploaded our most recent episode in which we discussed uh, the top five for each of us deep cuts, uh, characters from the garbage bin of Marvel history who would like to see trotted back out and thrown into um thrown into circulation for for some novel and interesting stories it was a really fun episode to record awesome awesome and and so where can they find again it's yet the podcast is called hype is my superpower right hype is my superpower you can find it anywhere you listen to your podcasts awesome awesome um paul anything you want to promote at the moment i know you're kind of taking a a pause and going to get back into it pretty soon 
Yeah, I'm just Zen Madman in the places you can follow me, and when I do stuff, I'll post about it or something. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> and of course, uh, I am the Ethical Panda. All the stuff I do is at theethicalpanda.com. There you'll find my podcasts about this, about Star Wars. We're doing great coverage on Rebels, going episode by episode as we get ready for the Kenobi show. Uh, for those of you who are MCU cast fans, Matthew Carroll, who is a long-known I would say MC uh, Star Wars agnostic. He's been doubtful of Star Wars and very much of Star. You know, Star Trek is more interesting. He's consented to uh, come on, and he's been watching Clone Wars episodes to get ready for the Kenobi show. So we've been having a lot of fun with him, kind of showing, like, yeah, there could be some. Uh, it's not just space wizards and lightning swords. So there's some interesting <laughs> ethical questions raised there. And of course, the best thing you can find on that on my website is all the ways to contact us. We love feedback. We love discussion. Uh, I really love to hear from, from folks who, what you thought about this episode. Again, I'm really trying to stay spoilers free, so please don't make it about spoilers. Uh, but whether you've seen the comics and, and really know the character, or you went in uh, knowing as little as Paul and I did, write in, let us know what you thought, let us know what you want us to think about uh, for next time, whatever it's going to be. So I'm behalf of myself, Paul, Will, and Steve. Thank you all so much, and have a great day. Thanks for having us. Mm-hmm. I better jog on. Later, later. <laughs>